the scripture says that the Holy Spirit gave to the church some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit does still today give the gift of prophecy to some men for some churches. We have a number of such prophets around the country today. I think that Merle Fuller is a prophet. Most of you know him. He ministered at Thomas Road Baptist Church. He has a very unusual message, a penetrating message. I thank Vance Havner, for those of you who will remember him. I think he is a prophet. He has certainly the gift of the Holy Spirit in a very unusual way. I think Dr. A.W. Tozer of the Christian and Missionary Alliance is a prophet, for certainly no other man in America today, or writing in America, I should say, has the insight into the holiness of God and the expectation of God concerning the walk and behavior of Christians. And I believe just as equally that God's gift of prophecy is upon our speakers. He has been a tremendous personal blessing and challenge to me. And already on yesterday, as he brought the morning and the evening message, we have sensed that God is saying to us some very unusual things. I'm so glad that there is a large number here tonight for the first time. I trust that as the Lord speaks to your own heart that uh, you'll find other nights this week that you can be out. I say this in a very sense of gravity and sincerity that it will be a long time before we'll have a voice of this nature around our city again. So buy up the opportunity, if you will, and be resolved that you'll not linger on the same plane of Christian living that you've been on, but that as God has opened your eyes and is pleased to give grace, you'll rise up to a higher plane. Now, Brother Rolf Barner, do you bring us what God's laid on your heart? Thank you, Brother Pastor. <clears throat> I'm honored to have the visiting pastor, the neighboring pastor. It's always an honor for one pastor to go over and say, Tick em. An amen to the efforts of another and the congregation of people to bring glory to the Lord and good to men. Tomorrow night we'll be speaking on the subject, Seeking the Lord. This generation of church people say they have salvation, but they don't have the Lord. Somewhere or another down the line, we divorce Christ and salvation. And all the testimonies I hear, we're thanking the Lord for what he's done for us, but you're not saved unless you love him for what he is, not what he's done for you. This generation can tell you when they're saved, but they don't walk with the Savior. And they've missed Christ. They've missed Christ. No man will ever become a Christian unless Jesus Christ, not for what he can do for you, but for what he is, become your supreme quest. You have to go after him with all of your heart, with a singleness of effort that will not be thwarted or you'll never get acquainted with the living Christ who carries within his body the power of his shed blood on the cross. The greatest miracle that God works in any day is not the raising of a dead body, or the healing of a sick body, but it is the changing of a God-hating resistor into a humble, Christ-seeking seeker. No man's ever saved unless God works the miracle of grace and sets him panting after not what the Lord can do for him, but for the Lord. The Bible doesn't say seek what the Lord can do for us. It says seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. I've been preaching this week. I've tried to spend this afternoon. I took a little cold last night. Didn't bring my overcoat. I thought it was summertime. And uh, <clears throat> last time I was here, the preacher up and made it have 26 inches of snow the first night. And this time he brought a winter blast. I'm full of aspirin, and uh, 
I, uh, I may explode, but <laughs> it'll be all right. But uh, I tried to think and pray through this afternoon the messages. I hope to speak so that Saturday night I may bring a harvest message on the subject, Watching Men Die. For the first 16 months I was a preacher. I averaged three funerals a day. Some days I preached as high as seven funerals a day. I was the only preacher in a city of 6,000 people in oil town and people died like flies. So in my early ministry, I find out what the churches of Jesus Christ never have learned yet, that people die. They do. People die. And to die without God. I've had so many hundreds of people die begging me to keep them out of hell. I've never been able to get over it. It's an awful thing to stand at the bedside or sit at the bedside of a man begging you to keep him out of hell, and you can't do it. You can't do it. And then Sunday morning, we hope that the Lord will help us to bring our message that I've seen in my little ministry. I don't know how many of them were saved. Over 17,000 people have professed to be saved as I brought that message. That's the only message I have that I keep on preaching, God seemed fit to use it as the harvest message. The God of the Bible kills people. He's going to kill you. He kills Christians. Get them out of the way, lest they fall into the damnation of the world. And he kills sinners whose cup of iniquity gets full. The God of the Bible kills people. Every time two people in America die now, one of them dies suddenly. America is the land of sudden death. And then we bring that message in the hope that Sunday night, our closing message, we can speak to the subject how God saves an infidel. I was the infidel, president of an infidel club in a Baptist college with 300 of the students joined the infidels club. I raised lots of hell while I was an infidel, and I know God has power to save. In the 40th chapter of the book of Isaiah is our beginning <coughs> message for uh, scripture tonight. I wish to speak on God's saving mercy tonight, and before we read the scripture, I'm going to speak on the most humbling thing that I've ever faced, and the most challenging thing that I've ever faced. In a moment, we're going to read about that thing that humbles us so and challenges all of God's people. The message of evangelism is twofold. The first message of true evangelism is to kill the flesh. The flesh must die. There isn't a single truth that fell from the lips of Jesus Christ that you can take and chew and digest and still live. You've got to die to take God's truth. Die to your preconceived notions and die to every ambition of the F-L-E-S-H flesh, that's just you. <clears throat> so the man who would fit in to the rising tide, it, it, we're coming back. There's revival on the way. It's coming as sure as I'm standing here. It's coming because we're so desperate, some of us are beginning to admit it. It's coming because God promises I will pour water on thirsty ground and there are more thirsty souls today than at any time you've ever lived. It's coming because God's never left himself without a witness and we've gone about as far as we can without him now and there's a resurgence. It's still small but it's growing. And I'm as certain as I'm alive that should the Lord be pleased to tear in his coming, the glory of the church is yet future. Great day coming, praise God. And it'll not come apart from a return to Bible preaching. There are just two 
things that God's people can avail themselves of in serving a sovereign Redeemer and going his way, not against him, but along with him. Jonathan Edwards said the task of every Christian generation is to find out the direction in which the sovereign Redeemer is going and then go along that way. You can't book him. You're going that way and the Lord's going that way. You're not going to get anywhere. Just flesh and the flesh profit is nothing. But if you can find out which way the Spirit of the living God blowing and go along with the tire, that's the way to go. That's the way to go. And if we would serve our generation in our day, we'd return to the message that kills the flesh and point men, behold your God. Isaiah said, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. It's interesting to know <clears throat> that to him that's crying is Almighty God, and he uses a voice to do the crying with. I learned that a long time ago. John the Baptist was called a voice of one crying in the wilderness, repent. Is God calling men to repentance to use the voice of John the Baptist? And so I occupy the pulpit. God help a preacher <clears throat> not to apologize, but to occupy the pulpit. God help a Christian to occupy the space God's given you. Amen? Brother, you can't beat me. I'm a voice. The one does the preaching is Almighty God. I don't command people to repent. God does. I don't point men to Jesus Christ. God does. I'm just a voice. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. We talked about this Sunday morning, how revival will come. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, thank God, it's yet future. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. That settles it. God said it. It's all coming. What shall the voice say? The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? Well, cry all flesh is grass. We're learning that finally. All of our tricks and high-powered methods to push Jesus off on people who feel no need of him are rebounding in our faces now. We've given holy things to dogs and cast out pearls before swine, and now our churches are places where you have to have a sheriff and two deputies every time you have a business meeting. They'll rend you, and that's what we are now. There's more unmitigated hell going on inside of our churches today than there is down in the saloon. That's right. All flesh is grass, it always has been, and all the godliness, goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower, flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth on it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower, flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion, that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice of strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold! Your God, this generation is not acquainted with the God of the Bible. 
The pulpits of America for 40 years have magnified man, not God. The so-called gospel has got us in the mess we're in now, has taken the glory from God that he says he'll give to none other, and has given it to men. Until our testimony meetings now are so blasphemous if God were not a God of mercy, he'd kill us every time we get up and pray about what we've done. All flesh is grass, always has been so. There's just a twofold message, all flesh is grass. Whatever you do, brother, it'll play out, it'll wither. This generation needs to be pointed the whole your God. The God who commanded darkness to shine, light to shine in darkness, for that hath shined in our hearts to give the knowledge of the glory of God where in the face of Jesus Christ. No man saved who hadn't seen the glory of God, not with these eyes, in the face of Jesus Christ. His face is painted in the gospel. Unless you beheld the glory of God in a bloody Savior hanging on a cross, you know nothing about salvation. Unless you see him who's now been exalted, sit down on the right hand of God on a throne forever, and you're happy he's on the throne, you know nothing about salvation. For if you wish to have a personal experience with and power from the living Christ, you've got to get to where he is, and he's seated on a throne. This generation knows nothing about an enthroned Savior. All it knows about is this little Jesus that you can accept as your personal Savior. Keep your pride. Keep your pet sin. And go on to heaven. In the first book of Timothy, at chapter 1, is the most challenging passage of scripture to my own heart, once the most humbling and the most challenging that I've ever faced, beginning at verse 11 of the first chapter of the first book of Timothy. Do you have it? I'm anxious that you take your pencil and mutilate your Bible a little bit. For here, the great truth of verse 11 is somewhat of by the King James translation. The King James translation that I have before me reads according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. But it ought to read, and this is not being smart, but here's a deep truth that I want you to miss. It really reads according to the gospel of the glory of God. According to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, which gospel of the glory of the blessed God, Paul said, was committed to my trust. I won't get back to that in a minute. And he says, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer? Here's what I got to brag about. I was a blasphemer. This is flesh and a persecutor and injurious. But I accepted Jesus Christ, my personal Savior, and went on to hell and also he obtained mercy. I come back to tell you Jesus is not offered as your personal Savior. Nowhere in the Bible is anything that smells like accepting Jesus as your personal Savior. I know that's what you said you've done, but if that's all you've done, you're still going to hell. You can't get your little pen knife 
and cut Jesus up. You see, the so-called gospel that filled our churches with this gang of hell raisers is only one half of one third of the whole Christ. Christ is presented, he's been made unto us of God, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.30. He hath of God been made unto us wisdom and sanctification and righteousness and redemption. All the wisdom God has for you is in the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. We got a generation of Christians now that can live from Sunday to Sunday and never crack the Bible call themselves saved. The teachings of Jesus mean absolutely nothing to them. They're going to hell depending on a profession or a decision they made. But a Christian couldn't live all day without feeding on God's Word, could he? You mean tell me a Christian could go all day without eating a meal at God's table? Why, of course he could. Of course he could. Of course, everything that God has for men, it's in Christ. He's been made of God. We didn't elect him. God made unto us and him everything. Everything. No man will ever be interested in Jesus shedding his blood on a gory cross until he's had his flesh shriveled by the soul-searching flesh killing demands of God from the lips of Jesus Christ. The whole gospel is to preach a whole Christ who brings us a message from God, who hangs on a cross as a priest, and we preach that. But we don't even preach his present work. We couldn't stay saved a half a minute. If it wasn't for the priestly work of Jesus Christ, now our advocate at the right hand of God. And then God Almighty, you didn't elect him, but God elected him to be Lord. He's Lord of men, whether they recognize him or not. He's prophet, priest, and king. And salvation is in being joined by faith to him. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, is the gospel invitation. I'll rest you how you rest me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You have no rest unless Christ's yoke of authority is around your life. Is that right? Unless you go in school to the divine teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't know a thing on God's earth about salvation. You trusted a proposition. You never met the Christ of the Bible. He cannot be cut up. He cannot be cut up. One half of one third of Christ has been what they call the gospel for three, four generations. I'm telling the truth, folks. No wonder we got a mutilated church membership you couldn't drag to a prayer meeting. They don't know Christ. They don't know Christ. And we preachers have butchered them long enough. We need to preach the whole Christ. He said, I obtain mercy. I obtain mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, get this straight. I believe in the five ministry. But the New Testament says that the day God saved you, he called you to be a preacher. Is that right? Now the Catholics divide you and me and say, I'm the preacher and you're the hearers, but that's Roman Catholicism, that isn't Bible. You know that's so. And to know you first laugh at that. If you are saved, it's not optional whether you are representing Christ or not. You are his representative. It's not optional whether you are witness for him or not. You are his witness. It's not optional whether you will be a proclaimer of the gospel. You are a proclaimer of the gospel. And I invite every professing Christian here to do with me 
Let's ask Paul to move over and say, Paul, we got to get in on this. According to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Oh, my soul, what will we do when we face the souls we butchered these last years for refusing to preach the gospel that reveals the glory of God and the utter nakedness of man. The only gospel that God Almighty turned over to these feeble hands and lips and eyes and hearts is a gospel that points men away from themselves to see God's glory. Where? In the poor Christian Testament saints of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And the law first mentioned, all of you acquainted with, the first time a truth is found in the Bible, we find out its meaning throughout the rest of the Scripture. If there's anything I've been interested in these 36 years, I've been trying to learn how to preach the gospel. The good news of what? Of the glory of God. Long since I learned what everything's all about. This earth is just a giant stage on which God has one purpose, to manifest and display the glory of his Son. That's what it's all about. The old Westminster Confession was right. The chief end of man is to do what? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The day you make the winning of souls your first concern is the day you become a butcher of souls. It's secondary. The one thing that's preeminent what things you ever you do, whether you eat or drink or play or preach or anything else, do it all for what? For the glory of God. For the glory of God. If God sees fit to get glory out of the rescuing of Adam's fallen race, thank him for it. But the big thing is the glory. God's truth. All these true methods these so-called evangelists use glorifying men detracting from the glory of him who has borne my glory I will not give to another. And but Ichabod is being written on the door of our church building. God's glory is departed. And all we got is flesh. Flesh, 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 stupid, putrid flesh. It speaks your flesh, your religious flesh, my flesh, all flesh is flesh. In the book of Exodus, at chapter 33, we have the first mention of the glory of God in the Bible. And here is one of the most solemn passages of Scripture ever been my read privilege to read. In verse 18 of Exodus chapter 33, Moses asked the most stupendous question I think any man ever asked, Almighty God. Moses clinched his fist and summoned up all of his courage and said to God, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Come see your glory. Well, that's some question. And God says, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do. Now, you watch. I'm going to show you my glory. Here it is. I'll make all my goodness pass before thee, and I'll proclaim the name, the authority of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. 
and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And he said, The Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass when you look at them now, while my glory passes by. What is it? My goodness. My proclamation of the name that has authority, the authority of the Lord. And my sovereign mercy, I exercise mercy as it pleases me. And I exercise grace as it pleases me. Those are three things that promote the glory of God, the goodness of God. Stand now on the rock, Moses, and as my glory passes by, you can't look at it all, it's too much. I'll put thee in a cleft of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while my glory passes by. And I'll take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back part. The sick left, he couldn't see it, it's killer. He couldn't see all the glory of God. Help us see a little bit. That's what this generation needs to see a little bit. Just the back parts of the glory of God. I'll take away my hand. I'll hide you over there in the cliffs of the rock so it won't kill you. And I'll parade my glory before you. Thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Behold your God. I'll cause all my goodness to pass before you. I'll proclaim the name. The name of the New Testament means authority. There's just one name that has authority. Authority. When he speaks, nothing can withstand his word. He speaks, and the sea is still. He speaks, and the dead are raised from the grave. He speaks, and men in spiritual graves are made alive in Christ Jesus. God's exalted him and given him a name, authority, all oh, authority. I'll proclaim the authority of the Lord, and I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I'll show mercy upon whom I will show mercy. Ladies and gentlemen, you better quit butchering sinners. You been out running around here? Lying to sinners long enough. We've got them to make a profession. They're still on the road to hell. One devil was driven out, but Jesus wasn't enthroned, and that little devil went and got seven of his kinsmen, and now they got eight demons where they had one. P.P. P. Martin said, get a man to make a profession without the enthroning of Christ as Lord. To fill up the vacuum. He's got eight chances to go to hell where he just had one before. You better listen to me. We have tried to apologize for the fact that Almighty God must do right, but he doesn't have to show mercy. And thus we cheapen grace and cheapen mercy, and we go out and sinners tell us when they take a notion they're going to get saved. And they think that the mercy of God and the grace of God is in a big pot, just waiting for them to come and get a little difficult and get saved. And this generation doesn't recognize that grace and mercy are in the hands of the living Christ. And that a man, in order to receive saving mercy and saving grace, must have a personal contact with him who has grace and mercy to give. And God help us, this generation needs to hear again that if you got any claim on God, it isn't mercy, it's death. And if God has to show mercy, it isn't mercy, it's death. 
And if we'd start preaching this way, some people would get them a club and try to kill God. But others would change their tune. And once more in Lynchburg, Virginia, men would catch a hold of your coattail and say, Brother Gold, you got just a minute. Yes. Do you suppose that a holy God would maybe save a fellow like me? Wouldn't you love to hear to talk like that? That's scriptural, brother. That'd be revival. Now, in our zeal, we go out and try to get them to accept Jesus, and they don't do it. They don't need him. Or if they go through the motions, there's nothing vital in most. Oh, when will we ever learn that God said, my glory will be displayed and made manifest and put into action by me being gracious to whom I will be gracious, I'll decide. And I'll decide to whom I'll show mercy. That's all. Well, that's generation of preachers been going up and down the land talking about, oh, God's got to give everybody a fair chance. Salvation's not by chance. It's by grace. Amazing grace. God doesn't owe anybody a chance. God doesn't owe anybody a fair deal. God doesn't know anybody one listen to the gospel. God doesn't know anybody's salvation. If he did, he owed the death of Christ, and that's monstrous. No, sir, salvation is of God's mercy and God's grace. And if we got some people saved, they'd never get over it. And they'd give the praise to God. And they'd sit down there juicing the devil's face. And say, I'm a trophy of God, unutterable, amazing, redeeming grace that He showed to a sinner like me. And it'd run them for this world, and they'd be transformed. They wouldn't be perfect, but bless God, they'd have a new heart, and a new spirit, and new ambitions, and new emotions. And you'd have one more in Sunday school next Sunday. And the budget would be a little higher. And there'd be one more in prayer meeting. And things would start pick up. If we just had guts enough to start standing on our hind legs and saying that God Almighty is sovereign in salvation. And he'll decide how he dispenses his mercy. I want to read you a tremendously solemn passage of Scripture. Would you be so kind? I know that you have your Bible. You're here from different churches. You're the, the inner circle of different churches. And I want you to read with me in the 11th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. Excuse me. The 11th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to read you a solemn passage of Scripture. Beginning at verse 20, here's the continental divide preparing for the first gospel invitation to an individual in the New Testament. Here's where the Jewish nation, through its leaders, have rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah. And then, verse 20 says, Then, when the rejection is full, began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. And he braved them after this wise, Woe unto thee, Chores, and woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you and thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would remain until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now notice the next verse. 
the only so solemn word, judgment, passed down into hell, condemned by the people of Sodom. Verse 25, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father. He's actually thanking God. Notice what he thanks God for. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Why? Because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them under babies. You better come down off your high horse, bud. You're going to hell. God will hide truth from you. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Isn't that some prayer of thanksgiving? Now notice verse 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. The Lord made that claim. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Jesus said, if you ever get acquainted with God, I'll have to make him real to you. Honey, this damnable stuff that you got saved because you decided for Christ, that was born in hell. Salvation is not by decision. Decision is always response to salvation. Paul made a decision in Macedonia. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do but Christ should reveal himself to me? Salvation is when God made real to you, is that right? Who can make God real to you? Jesus said, I can, nobody else. Honey, he reveals the Father to whomsoever he will. Now, you can get mad about that and get your club and try to kill Jesus, or you can come down off the high horse and take the position of a beggar and say, Lord, I got no claim on you, but if thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. And the Lord said to him, and bless God, he said to me, I don't know what he'd say to you. I will. The only safe place for a human being is at the foot of the cross, not making any demand, just begging for mercy. Paul said, I obtained mercy from the one who reserves the right to give or withhold, to show mercy on whom he will. He said, my glory. Brother, if you ever get saved, there's one thing, your theology may be as bad as mine, but you'll know one thing, you'll know who saved you. God saved you. Then might ask you, who saved you? You say, God saved me. God don't save this generation of Baptists. They, they accepted Jesus. But Paul said, I didn't. I, I obtained mercy. <laughs> and he revealed himself when it pleased God. Who separated me from my mother's womb. Called me by the gospel to reveal. His son in me. Down the road to Damascus, he had an experience. You'll have to have one, not with these eyes, but with eyes of faith. Christ is made real to you. And when that happens, you'll decide 
You say, Lord, that settles it. What do you have me do? Just name it and I'll do it. The idea of a man being a Christian to whom the will of God is not the biggest thing in his life is silly. 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 I long for a return to the preaching that just takes everything away from man, all pleasures right, your decision, your profession, your goodness, your righteousness, the whole outfit ain't worth a dime. The only hope, behold your God. Behold your God. Oh, lift up your eyes and look, cry. Behold your God. Oh, he's a redeeming God. He's a saving God. He's the God of Jacob. He saves old horse traders. Bless God. I love to preach that kind of a book. And I like to keep preaching. It takes several months before we made a dent. For all the churches in this town started pointing men, not taking everything away from men. Of course, we've, we've made salvation by man's decision for so long. If they're going to go to hell holding on to it, but salvation comes from a living God. Behold your God. Lift up your eyes. There's life in a look, brother. Life in a look. It's not in your little decisions. It's in God making himself real to you. Amen. That's right. Ah, yeah. That's true. I've seen a little taste of it. Biggest trouble I've had for 30 some odd years is the church members fighting the truth. They just determined not to have God get the glory. But God's going to get it. He'll get it by damning you or saving you. You've been turned over to the risen Christ who bought you on the cross. He'll be your judge or your savior. Amen. He's got you on his hand. He's going to do something with you. One day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess what? That Jesus is Lord. Is the salvation of everybody? No. Too late for that, but not too late for the glory of the Father. That's the big thing. How precious such scriptures as this one I read appear against the background of the fact that God Almighty doesn't have to show mercy that you got no claim on him. He's under no obligation to save you. They can get glory out of damning your soul to hell. How precious it is to read. And you have he quickened. Who were dead in trespasses and sin. Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our manner of living in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others but God. But God, that's the thing. But God, who in rich in mercy, he got plenty. You got no claim on it. He gives it as he pleases. But he's rich in mercy. For his great love, where we be loved us. Even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us together with Christ, and hath raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavens in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his great hand in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, far by grace, are you saved? Not by death, but by grace. How wonderful to read in the book of Romans at chapter 10 such an expression as this in the background of the sovereign mercy of God, for there is, verse 12, no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Isn't that wonderful? What I'm pleading for, if we tell people the truth, all your little efforts, that grass, it'll wither. 
no hope except in God. You got no claim on him. He's pleased to give mercy to whom he will. Cuss him out or become a beggar. Who knows? You might be able to join Paul and say, I've seen mercy. I bet you'd be mighty glad if you did. Yeah? That's the God I preach before your God. Uh, he didn't have to, but in grace he stooped to save old Rock Bond. As an infidel denying God, he saved me. He didn't kill me and send me to hell. He showed mercy. I've seen mercy. I ain't never been able to get over it. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus found me. Out in the darkness, no light could I see. Oh, what a wonder. He put his great arm under, and wonder of wonder, he saved even me. Oh, if our churches were full of all his people, that had obtained mercy and never had been able to get over. Oh, they said, you know what? God showed mercy to me. Oh, yes, I was a sinner. And God showed mercy. He that's obtained mercy would be mighty merciful to others, wouldn't he?